Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the last curated talk of the day, uh, or at least one of many. Um, I'm here to introduce you to uh, Dr. Christoph uh, Lameter. Um, he was uh, previously the principal engineer at SGI who and brought Linux to supercomputers, and today continues to bring uh, performance and scale-oriented uh, systems into the Linux kernel. Pr his previous talk was on um, making kernel objects movable uh, as a proposal, and now he is here to talk about bringing uh, fabric networking, uh, high-speed fabrics, into the network stack. Sorry. All right, thank you. Um, this is a problem that has uh, I've been here for quite a long time, and uh, it is an issue for my company uh, because uh, we, ha we have to use high-speed networking for competitive business reasons, and it's very difficult to do, and uh, things don't behave the way actually they should be doing if they would be regular network devices. And uh, since uh, we were successful in getting the high-speed fabric uh, stuff all into Red Hat last year, um, and it's getting, it's better now. Uh, we thought maybe the best thing is to completely integrate that with the network stack in Linux. Because uh, I also saw that the Linux, the network, Linux network developers have the same issues um, that we have to solve with the high speed fabric stack. So um, I talked with a lot of people last week, and uh, uh, there are not many uh, high performance. Uh, computing developers here, so I'm going to give an introduction into what high-speed fabrics are and how they're going to be used, so that you see what the point of all of this is. Not just, so that's not just a sexy term here. Um, yeah, so I'm trying to build a bridge now. There's two different subsystems in the kernel. They, has, they have been disjoint, but they, they offer similar functionality, and I think they need to be uh, put together. So um, high-speed networks. Um, uh, so uh, I'm going to give an overview, talk about the history of the uh, RDMA subsystem, which is the uh, subsystem where we do high-speed networking these days, then talk about the network stack and some of its problems, and uh, then about the RDMA stack, what, what issues we have there, and then try to combine the two and see how can we make progress there and how can we come to a unified network stack that satisfies today's requirements. There's some work already in progress. Um, I've had extensive talks with uh, the prime company in this field, Mellanox, and their chief architect about this, and we have a kind of an agreement uh, that we want to move forward with this plan here. Um, so what are the high-speed uh, networks or fabrics? These are networks that generally are uh, in speed higher than 10 gigabits per second. So 40, 56 gig, 100 gig uh, uh, is, is typical in that area. Um, there is a con there's a war between multiple vendors in the area. There's Intel and uh, Mellanox. And uh, the speeds get escalated every year, hopefully, <laughs> every two years. So we hope uh, to see 200 gigabits uh, this, this year. And I guess in four to five years, or maybe we will at some point get to one terabit per second. Um, that seems to be uh, the idea uh, in the industry. Um, at that speed, uh, the regular network stack just gets into trouble associating that throughput. That's not possible. Um, because the latency going through the network stack is extremely high uh, compared to the speed of the uh, packet on the wire. So there's often techniques being used uh, to bypass the kernel. Um, then there's something called RDMA. This means remote DMA operations. You have two processes running on, one running on the remote hosts, one on the local hosts, and they can do direct memory transfers from user space memory between those two things without any kernel involvement. That is a requirement to do very high speed uh, transfers because then you don't have to invoke the kernel logic. You have no software in between. It's just the hardware doing the transfer. Okay, this was um, is handled by a separate subsystem that was used to call, be called the Infinity Band subsystem. But then it was renamed to be the RDMA subsystem. This is now not only supports Infinity Band, but also Ethernet as well as OmniPath. Um, so that is what is there. If anything is unclear, if you have any questions, just ask immediately, otherwise I may not be too thorough on these uh, things. So why would you use this cool stuff? Um, obviously for large volume transfers, there's complex simulations like the weather, weather prediction, machine learning, uh, hurricane prediction, um, nuclear explosions, the reason that the US can still sustain its nuclear arsenal. Um, despite of not doing any real tests, is because they are simulated in a huge supercomputer that uses this technology as their interconnect. 
Um, there's various dark services that we can talk about. These are usually the three-letter acronyms in the US, and they do make extensive use of this one for uh, intelligence operations and for uh, analyzing where to find the bad guys. Um, financial services is using the technology extensively for valuations, options calculation, index cor correlations, and uh, various other things. Um, so the basic research in physics, chemistry, genomics, and quantum theory is all based on, this, on clusters that operate with this technology. Without this, I don't think this would be feasible. Uh, you wouldn't be able to have the materials that we have today and uh, the techn the techniques that we use. Gene ge sequencing and gene modifications. This is another field where uh, uh, this is used to do very fast simulations of what, an, what a gene change would do or how could you actually manipulate a, a gene strand in a large uh, genome. Uh, this is getting also um, currently a very high degree of development there and we are making rapid progress towards uh, healing various diseases that we didn't know before. Combination of genomics and machine learning that makes it possible using high-speed fabrics. Um, then we have the design and construction of complex machines. If airplanes are constructed these days, they are constructed in a, a high-performance computing grid uh, where you can actually walk through the airplane before you ever manufacture it and you can actually see how the pieces that you put have in the airplane, how they interact before you even come, come down with the detailed uh, blueprints and before you go to the factory and actually manufacture the stuff. This allows you to streamline the production process and uh, avoid mistakes during production. Um, so because you can simulate all these things before you actually ever do something act, uh, and, and work out how the real parts are. This also goes for the military fighters, tanks and um, stuff. This is all done these days with, uh, with these with this high-speed networks. Nanotechnology, another thing. Um, then also th these techniques are used for surveillance. Um, for example, it's known that the city of London has a high-speed network. They correlate all cameras in, the, in London and they can basically, if you drive your car through London, they can tell you, they can exactly sh uh, sh see where the car is going. They have a 3D view of uh, everybody you interact with with the car if, uh, and whoever gets in and out of the car. They can interpolate from various camera angles what, what's behind the car. Uh, so there's, uh, because there have been a lot of uh, uh, um, attacks in, in London, this is basically done and you can uh, have a history of database. You can, uh, if something happens, you can reconstruct what happened in the last five hours there, who was there, and they can really uh, basically figure out who, were there, who was there and can track down uh, who probably caused that uh, uh, attack. And this is also done uh, uh, on a worldwide basis with satellites and stuff and various, uh, uh, various entities. Also today, supercomputers would not be possible with this. Usually the high-speed fabrics are used to interconnect various computational elements in these supercomputers. And uh, so uh, as far as I know, all of the leading supercomputers have this interconnect. And actually, yeah, all of them these days run Linux. So, uh, this is one of the key features in Linux that enables the use in all these areas. And that's also why Linux dominates in all of these leading research areas and uh, is actually key to making progress in science uh, and around the, glo the, the globe these days. So uh, history of the high-speed fabrics. Um, originally, uh, uh, high-speed fabrics were only used to connect uh, multiple processing elements. This could be used as an address bus. Initially, these were proprietary in the 1980s, 1990s, and 2000s. At some point, all the vendors uh, realized there was a huge effort going on to this, and they would, it would be beneficial to come up with some kind of a common standard in order to avoid duplicating these efforts, have common cabling and stuff, because uh, it gets very expensive to, uh, for each company to develop their own proprietary uh, cables, as well as software, and so on and so on. So uh, they formed the Open Fabrics Alliance around 2003, 2005, um, and uh, uh, constructed software as well as standards on how such an interconnect would work. And that's the code that resulted from that was then submitted to the Linux kernel, and it was called the InfiniBand subsystem. Um, in, that, in that time frame, I was a, a consultant for Chelsea, and we were trying to get uh, offload technology into the network stack that was wrongly rejected by the Linux de uh, developers Linux at that point because it would take the uh, state of the uh, connection and put it into hardware. And there was no way that we could get that in there. And that was one of the reasons why a separate subsystem was developed. 
because we could not convince the network developers to actually play ball with this. And so since 2003, 2005, this has been developed as a separate subsystem and is not integrated into the network stack. I think about five years later, the network developers figured out that something like that exists and were very, very surprised. But <laughs> at that point, it was established. <laughs> um, so um, first of all, that was just InfiniBand. Then it was extended to also cover Ethernet with, with, with a standard called Rocky. So in addition to messaging, you could also do direct RDMA transfers between process address spaces uh, through the uh, InfiniBand subsystem. And at that point, it was then renamed into uh, RDMA subsystem because it was only InfiniBand. It was also doing Ethernet. Um, and then we get into this constant upgrade of the speeds. Um, 2008, 2007, we were at 20 gigabits. Uh, 2009, 40 gig QDR and InfiniBand came out. Uh, 2010, actually, the majority of civil computers were running InfiniBand. This took all of them. Uh, then had about 56 gigabyte FDR. In 2013, Intel began to create a competing technology called OmniPath to InfiniBand. Um, and uh, now in 2015, we had uh, 100 gig EDR InfiniBand. Then we have 100 gig OmniPath Intel, and uh, this year probably 200 gig uh, HDR InfiniBand, and probably a competing standard from uh, Intel as well. Uh, so this is uh, right now how things got going, and that's why we expect this to uh, duplicate, d double it maybe every two years for the next 10 years or so. And this is, yeah, this is a key technology um, used also for the exascale vision of the US government. The exascale vision is uh, the idea to build a very powerful supercomputer by the end of the decade. And uh, in order to do that, we have a very, need to have a very high capacity, high speed uh, interconnect between the various processing elements that compose such a supercomputer. And again, such a supercomputer is necessary to make uh, progress in science and is seen as the foundational basis for uh, uh, keeping the technology technological superiority of the United States at this point. And this here, here's a diagram on the um, various uh, techniques, technologies, and how they make uh, progress and how we expect these uh, speeds to develop. Any questions, comments? Then uh, we have the regular network stack. Uh, usually, when people are new, come new to the area, they think, okay, we can just use a network stack. Um, but there we have problems with high packet rates and latency. The system app called API is orders of magnitude uh, slower than the time it takes for the hardware to send a packet. Um, sending a packet can just take a few nanoseconds. Uh, entering a kernel and exiting a tech may take five uh, microseconds. Uh, so you will never be able to use any reasonable amount of bandwidth with uh, a high-speed fabric. Um, the network stack uh, also even has these problems at 10 gigabits, and at that point we have various uh, methods to increase the packet rates. So we have aggregation technologies, LSO, GSO, TSU, TSO, uh, that basically makes ensures that with a single system call, you can have massive amounts of packets being sent by the kernel. That avoids, that, that amortizes the overhead of a system called better. So this improves the, the, the situation, and it's adequate for uh, gigabit connections and 10 gigabit connections, but it is not satisfactory for higher speed connections. Then we have flow steering. With that, you can uh, dissect an incoming stream of data and put it into multiple cores, and the hardware sorts out which, where which data should be going. That also increases the, uh, the reception rate, because uh, now you have two cores involved in receiving the data. The problem then is having, uh, sorting this stuff out and being able to make sense out of the, the, the data stream because uh, the state of the stream may not uh, be established because the packet went to another processor. So these are all techniques that the vendors had to support in hardware. And so we have a continual ev evolution of the NIC hardware, even on a 10 gig and 1 gig level, in order to be able to put full bandwidth on the wire. Then, in recent developments within the last three years, we have actually the movement to abandon the network stack by using DPDK. This is a data plane development kit by Intel. That one allows you to directly map the NIC into user space, and you can write the device driver now in user space. That means you directly manipulate the registers and the device parameters, um, that which gives you full low-level access to the hardware, and with that, uh, you can get yeah, the bare metal. At that point, you're losing the advantages of an operating system, which is an abstraction from the device. Now you suddenly have to be exposed to all the bits and things that you can flip on the device layer. And when, when the vendor upgrades their uh, device driver, your code will break. 
and you can adapt to uh, adapt to that and uh, go through your user space device driver and fix things up in order to make use of the new, new, uh, new feature. And you cannot ma move between vendors because they all have diff different bits in different places and they have different semantics for memory transfers and all the other things. Some vendors see that as an advantage. Yes, right. Some vendors think they can lock you in with that, right? <laughs> And uh, I've talked with a lot of uh, folks in that area that see that they see no other way. But most of them are not, uh, not aware that there is actually a standardized network stack that allows you, which is called the RDMA stack. And they're totally surprised when I mentioned that, and that this has been established for uh, more than a decade now, and that, we've, that there's a huge amount of users of these things worldwide. The reason is it's a parallel network stack. It's not fully integrated into the network stack. The network device guys, network developers mostly know nothing about this. And, um, that, that is, is, a, is a huge issue. So then we come to the, to the uh, issues of the RDMA stack. Um, this is kind of a sidecar. It's uh, bolted on. It is this parallel network stack. It does similar things to the network stack, but can't do all the twinky bits that the uh, uh, main stack does, but it can give you uh, uh, speed, throughput, and, and latency. Communication occurs to a specialized library, it's lib uh, IB verbs SO, that has a special API to the kernel that allows a direct mapping of the elements of the device to control data streams into user space. And this is standardized, so you have uh, the, the same shared data structure and it can be used with multiple devices to, to do this, this, uh, this I.O. in a high-speed way. If the device is being upgraded, they still conform to the, to the standardized uh, data structure, so you don't have to change your user space code if a new device comes out or if you want to use a device of another, another manufacturer. So this is an attempt to uh, have it both ways. You do bypass, you do offload, but you keep the keep an existing standard, you keep the API to the hardware the same. So the RDMA stack uh, looks like this is just for many people, it's also a misunderstanding that people think this is just the transfer of memory directly between the process space of one, of one process on one system to the uh, address space of a process running on another system. That is one of the key features of the stack, but it also behaves like a regular stack. It does messaging, it does reliable connections, it has all the elements that the regular stack has as well. And these can also be used in an offloaded way without requiring one-to-one uh, uh, -one RDMA operations. And in fact, the RDMA stack can be used to send uh, TCP frames and UDP frames, and you can actually uh, communicate with another system using the RDMA stack. On one hand, you have the RDMA stack, and then there, there's a regular TCP stack on another system. You can communicate with that, and you can use that to do also offload and do, to have a very fast reacting server. And this is frequently done. And that kind of feature is a bit un unnerving to the uh, people who write the major network stack. <laughs> because this is, this is the bypass stuff that they never wanted. <laughs> um, so the problem is it is not the network stack. So you, it often behaves in unexpected ways. You don't have the tools and the semantics of the regular stack. So the, you don't see the stuff when you type IFSTAT. You don't see it when you use the IP tool. So you, it, it is networking going on within the system, but the regular tools don't show that. And neither is it in the net, in the POC net subsystem and things. It's, it's not there. Um, the system has a smaller user base and therefore also limited documentation. The equipment is usually very high priced, but well, compared to the 10 gig adapters, it's actually not that high priced anymore. Okay. And there's a difficulty when you're connecting the fabrics to regular Ethernet networks. You, you can, of course, create Ethernet frames, but if you create infinity band uh, uh, frames, uh, we're using the RDMA stack, then uh, there is no way to do, have a clean transition to Ethernet unless you use a special version of the Infinity Band protocol, which is called IP over IB, which creates a, f uh, a f special frame that can be converted into Ethernet later. So, <laughs> but the design of these frames and these standards was done uh, not for the convenience of the end user, but in order to reach the full performance of the medium and in order to have very high speed and high volume transfers possible over the medium. So the design criteria is not the same as it was for the regular stack. So I think what, what one thing that we, I wish like would, would, would be done is to just first of all since add the infinity band omnipath support to the regular network stack. 
Again, these are regular network protocols that allow messaging and connect, uh, connected mode like TCP and unconnected mode diagrams like UDP. This is all there, but it's not supported by the regular stack. So a straightforward way would be to just add the support for these protocols to the network stack. So that you can create a socket with a type of infinity band or a type of omnipath, and then you can send and receive um, uh, packets of that uh, format. <laughs> Once you have that, you can probably remove these pieces from the RDMA stack. And then, of course, uh, the, the tools should be able to reflect what's going on. And you can see some data going, flowing through these interfaces so that the regular tools could gradually gain uh, a way to control uh, the, uh, these, these protocols. Uh, I, at that point, also, some of the layers of the RDMA stack could be removed. And uh, it would simplify the RDMA stack significantly. So then you can use the POSIX network function. You can send a send message, receive message with the infinite band protocol. You wouldn't get the full uh, performance and latency that you expected from, an high, from the high performance stack, but it would be possible to do that. And there's often services like authentication and stuff that you want to do on, an, on a fabric that are not uh, latency critical and not performance sensitive. And it would simplify also the development of these tools for these high speed fabrics. Right now, if somebody writes an, applica an application for these high-speed fabrics, you have to know the RDMA uh, subsystem. You have to know the ways how you do these things with uh, your space mapped uh, I.O. and the, these, these queue pairs. And it, it takes a lot of time for someone to learn that and then to write a server that will operate on these fabrics. If you would have the regular POSIX APIs for that, it would simplify the, uh, the service, making services available on these fabrics. And uh, one of the advantages for the uh, fabric protocols would all be that we would finally have more stability. I've been uh, dealing with that the last five years, and I finally convinced these guys to use Git and uh, to use regular QEQA. And uh, I had a lot of resistance to overcome in various uh, management layers and in the companies that are competing in, in the area. And uh, everybody wanted to run their proprietary stack. And uh, only last year, we finally came to the that everything is open, everything is on Git, every, the regular patch flow is happening on that layer now. We have a regular maintainer, um, so this uh, subsystem behaves like a regular network, uh, like a regular uh, uh, kernel uh, subsystem now, but it's not integrated yet into the network stack. Um, okay, once we have the general support for uh, uh, these protocols, we also then would need the ability to do offload through the regular network stack. This means we have to add something like queue pairs uh, to, the, uh, to the network stack. A queue pair is basically uh, in user space. You have a send queue and receive queue, and you have the necessary structures to describe that. You can create your data that you want to send in user space, update the uh, the, the queue and the system will begin to send stuff. If you receive data, it will immediately show up in user space in a defined way and the controller will tell you that there is data there. This enables you to, have, to do I.O. without the involvement of the network stack and allows you uh, massive uh, capacities of, of data coming into the user space and also sending and receiving with, with reasonable uh, latency and with the ability to use the full bandwidth of these high-speed mediums. If you have this, uh, then the, the, the key function of the RDMA subsystem is no longer necessary. At that point, we could actually disassemble the RDMA subsystem and shift everything over into uh, the regular network stack. Uh, at that point also, if we make this generally available for all devices, we can do offload for any network device. If, uh, uh, if we can create these control blocks in a standardized way, we can just use any NIC and, and uh, have the function for any NIC to directly send and receive from user space. This would be beneficial for all device drivers in the kernel. But again, the, the critique from 2003 is still there that we would take the state away from the network stack. Yes, we will. And, but we do that in a, in a controlled fashion. And I think it has to be done because the network stack cannot really uh, maintain uh, the, uh, the features necessary to support these uh, high-speed fabrics. And the, so the diagrams here are um, some kind of a small explanation of how this works. If you look at the green one, you have two address spaces of two different pr processes sitting on various machines in the fabric. And they both have send and receive queues. And below there is a network. 
And just by manipulating the send and receive queues, I can send bits of, uh, of pieces of data back and forth between the uh, machines without an, uh, too much of an activity of the operating system. This can be all controlled by hardware. And this is the, uh, the classic verbs uh, uh, workflow here uh, of the event subsystem or ADMX system. You create a work request in user space. Uh, the next CC is the work request. Uh, works around it and sends the data and then gives you another request block back telling you that this request is complete and the user uh, application then checks the structures, okay, this work has been done and then can act on the data. And this is uh, the way to avoid the, the system call. Basically, you expose the, a, a, a queue, a CFQ and send queue of a leak into user space. Then what's, what's missing now is uh, we have the QPS that we also need uh, proper RDMA support. This means uh, the ability to do large scale transfer from one address space to another address space on another system. This was just messaging. Um, that would be a, a new feature for the network stack. So uh, this means uh, one process has to know the address spaces of another process on a remote system and we will be able to directly transfer into that uh, address space. This works by uh, each process registering a section of the address space with the NIC and saying, okay, the remote systems are allowed to do direct transfers directly into this section of the address space. And uh, with that, uh, only you can do large scale IOs, the gigabit size IO is mostly done with, with using this uh, approach. Um, if you do this, then also the protocol can support that, must support that. So InfiniBand and OmniPath, of course, support that natively because that's how they were created. But also Ethernet has a, the extension called Rocky. So you could actually implement that in a generic way for any Ethernet driver in the kernel. If the Ethernet driver doesn't support that in hardware, you can easily create a Rocky a packet uh, and by the kernel stack and uh, have a software simulation of this feature in a very easy way. So this could be actually trans transparently reworking for any device in the uh, regular network stack. But what you have right now is, if I want to use Rocky, I may have this uh, socket open in the regular network stack, and then I'm open another socket um, on the, uh, with the RDMA stack, and now I'm doing uh, RDMA transfers via, the, via one device, and I'm using the regular messages from the other one. It's pretty confusing, and um, there are often strange interactions there. So, um, I think this would be uh, the, the best way to do the things that makes this all pretty standard and uh, generally available. So the results would be, what should be, what could be, one network stack, and you can use traditional net, net, net messaging, connected sockets or QPs, as well as RDMA requests. So that would be, make it all, put it cleanly together and you have a unified uh, network subsystem that can also uh, do all the extras that high-speed fabrics uh, have to do. The tools work for any network device, the stability is improved for the high-speed fabrics, and the bandwidth and the latency problems that we are fighting with in the network stack would be solved because we have a defined uh, technology to do that and you don't need to constantly invent new technologies. I think I've seen four different proposals last year on how we can in introduce a direct uh, uh, offer technology into the network stack. And uh, finally, we talked to them and said, here, here, there's one here. We have already done this for 10 years, right? This, um, then there was some discussion, yeah, how do we do this, how do you do that? And um, then, of course, they wanted to do it their way, but after a month or so, this died down, and uh, I think they are now pretty much uh, uh, zeroing on that one. This is also driven by a project by Red Hat to do 100 gig uh, I.O. Uh, to the network stack, and um, various developers have been trying to speed up various kernel components in order to reach this 100 gig uh, limit but they're not able to get there. They can make these small improvements, 10, 20 percent. And basically, from what I'm, the numbers that I'm seeing out, they can do 10 gigabit probably, or maybe 10 million gigabit, but they will never be able to reach 100 gigabit with that kind of approach. And I've even had to uh, put various components into my network subsystem in order to uh, improve that speed. We do now do uh, aggregate uh, uh, allocation of uh, slab objects, uh, aggregate freeing of slab objects. Now we're also doing aggregate allocation of kernel pages. So we are trying to do with batching to solve this and get a little bit higher on this. 
but it's pretty clear from the numbers that we will not be getting to the 100 gig uh, limit. And 100 gig is yet last year's speed. We are already going into 200 gig, and we should be preparing for that. OK. So that's all right. I had uh, to say. <laughs> opening the floor to questions. As, uh, if anyone's got any, I'd love to hear them. All right. So this actually looks kind of like uh, IO completion ports on Windows. Is that possible? Um, the methods there to do these completion queue entries and stuff are the same. The queue pair uh, idea has been used on various platforms, and uh, the uh, RDF Pinnipad technology as well as the OmniPath is also available on Windows. Any further questions? Is, is there any maybe comments? <laughs> <laughs> We're not supposed to get those, but should we modify the next second this way or not? <laughs> Just wondering what the state of the performance of CPUs is in relation to this sort of technology. Is Which the, the GPUs? Uh, CPUs. Okay. Yeah. So, like, how how do you see feeding? this data into CPUs, or is it uh, primarily as a, as a hot point between uh, storage mechanisms or something? Uh, the problem with CPUs is that their individual performance hasn't been uh, increasing that much over the last decade or so. And there's probably not much hope there. We already have uh, techniques that will populate the caches with the data that's coming in via the uh, network de devices, and that gives a lot of advantage. Um, but you could only reach level three, I think, with that, layer three. Um, if, you could get, if you could get into layer one, it would be great. <laughs> Anyways, uh, with, with, with the 100 gig, it's, it's pretty difficult to, uh, to uh, work with the data rate, right? But usually you get a huge amount of data into, into memory, and then uh, you inspect certain things and forward it to some other uh, device, or you have multiple processing elements, multiple uh, cores running, and one core is receiving data, inspecting it, and then handing off a pointer to another core, which then will process uh, aspects of the data. Um, that is the, the, the way to do things. You cannot really process this data in line. And also with, with the uh, RDMA subsystem, you can aggregate this. So uh, you can tell, the, the, OK, give me everything that you got right now. And you get 1,000 requests. You inspect the requests. And uh, when you're done, you get the next 1,000. <laughs> For those of us without expensive network hardware, is there a way we can play with these sorts of things and get familiar with IV verbs and stuff on virtual machines or simulators of some sort? Yes, uh, in the newest kernel version we have a, uh, an, 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 an uh, RDMA bridge which allows you to, I think it's called IBRXE. With that, you can have any network device function uh, with an RDMA stack. So it uses the te Rocky technique, so uh, it can, can just, you can just, you just attach it to a network device, and that network device then becomes RDMA capable, and you can write software uh, that can use Ethernet to communicate uh, between various boxes. And at that point, your RDMA-based applications will work. Is that all? Yeah. Hey, there's another one. Hang on. I'm, I'm curious to know what API a user space application would use to get a socket pair. Uh, you create a queue pair, basically. Um, so there's an RDMA uh, call for that, where you get a, basically you get a, a receive queue and a send queue. And then it's like, in, like a regular socket call, and you can tell the uh, RDMA stack which protocol you want to use, which port you want to listen on, <laughs> and stuff like that. And then you pre-allocate, let's say, a thousand elements for a send and receive queue, and uh, tell the RDMA stack, "Oh, you're ready now." And whenever a packet comes in, it stuffs it into one of the slots, and you can and then inquire the uh, control block and see how many packets have I received yet, and then you can work on those. And so the the control block is updated while you process this, this, this data. And the sending works in another way. You give it a series of pointer and then another control block, and uh, then uh, the helper will send all those things. And you can monitor the state of that in the control structure. 
and you can add uh, new blocks to the end and take them away from the front. Hi, um, I was just wondering, do these support uh, any kind of accelerated encryption on the wire encryption? Uh, not to my knowledge. Again, this is, this is uh, high speed fabrics, they are focusing on high speed communications in protected private networks. The extras that are usually in the network stack are not there yet, but if we can move this into the network stack, we potentially can get accelerators that will make this work the, the right way. Um, the richness of features that are available in the regular network stack is not there. This is in a focus on uh, performance, latency, and throughput. Uh, if there are no further questions, um, I'd like to bring, uh, encourage everyone to thank uh, Christoph for his uh, great talk. And uh, it was a gift to thank you for your time and effort.